Yes, so this is um, this presentation today is uh, about differentiating uh, the types of uh, Taoist energetic practice. Specifically, uh, I'm interested in looking at the differences between qigong and meditation, um, and also what different types of qigong there are within uh, within the context of Taoist energy practices. So, in order to do this, we have to take a uh, historical view first. And then after we take the historical view, we can talk about the specifics of individual practices. So we can start with the study of nur nurturing life, uh, yangsheng, which is a very ancient idea in China. It's not entirely clear exactly when it originated, but we know that all the way back at least to um, the Tao Te Ching and the uh, Nanhua Jing, or what people usually call Zhuangzi, we have this idea of um, using different types of self-cultivation techniques and approaches and mindsets in order to maintain and nurture life and nurture well-being. Um, and I think that the Nanhua Jing, so the Zhuangzi, is probably the best ancient text in that regard because it exposes us to a lot of different types of practices that were popular at his time in history. So uh, a couple of ones that I can think of that ended up becoming formal Taoist practices later would have been the um, chapter called uh, Adjusting Controversies, where the hermit uh, Nan Guo Zixi, uh, sorry, I've put that in the document wrong, but Nan Guo Zixi uh, is sitting in apophatic meditation, and uh, he appears to have the continents of petrified wood and uh, dead ashes. And so his attendant asks him, you know, what's what's happening to you? And uh, Nan Guo Zixi comes out of his meditation, and he's kind of annoyed, and he lets out a big sigh, and he says, Ah, uh, you know, you can hear the wind blowing through the air, but can you hear all of the different orifices that the wind travels through? And can you hear the orifices of the earth, or the orifices of the, of the trees, and so on and so forth? And uh, what I've done is I've just sat, and I've forgotten myself, and I've become one with the with the nature of the the wind blowing through the, all of these different um, openings in in nature, which is um, sort of a paraphrased on my part because I don't have the quote right in front of me, but we can see that people at the time of Zhuangzi, which is sometime before 300 BC, were practicing seated meditation techniques in which they were entering into a state of self-forgetting, and so this would later become a major root of uh, Taoist meditation practice. Um, but by the first century AD, we start to see also practices splitting into various different subcategories that we in modern times would associate with Qigong. So um, we know because of the... Um, there was a major tomb, a funerary complex uh, discovered in uh, Hubei province, um, I believe in the 1930s. Um, where a number of different documents were discovered uh, that included uh, early versions of the Tao Te Ching that nobody had previously seen. Um, they included astrology documents, and they included things like the Dao Yin Tu, the chart of Dao Yin, um, and also texts about uh, breathing methods. And so we know that um, as far back at the time as the time, I'm sorry, as far back as the time when the people um, were entombed in that funerary complex um, at Ma Wangdui, which was probably uh, actually around the first century BC, so during the early Han uh, dynasty, then there were already people who were engaged in the practice of um, stretching for health and uh, doing various different breathing techniques associated with fasting. So we know that Qigong uh, as a practice dates back at least that far if not farther. And of course, Zhuangzi uh, also references these breathing practices in the Nanhua Jing. He talks about um, spitting out the old and bringing in the new. Um, and so these techniques have been around for, for quite a long time in some form, uh, but over time they gradually began to develop into more robust individual schools of thought. So when we think about um, Taoist Qigong practices and Taoist meditation practices, there's a lot of different ways to categorize them. And if we categorize them 
very, very finely. Um, we would probably end up with hundreds of individual categories of practices. But um, from the modern perspective, so my opinion, but also the opinion of uh, various leading researchers in China, such as uh, Hu Fuchen, uh, Chen Yingning, and, and others who are um, quite well known in the subject of researching Taoist energy arts, um, the practices can be summed up as follows. Uh, in the meditation school, there is zuo wang, so sitting and forgetting, ding guan, uh, stable observation, tai shi, embryonic breathing, uh, and nei dan, internal alchemy, as the main sort of meditation schools. And then in the Taoist qigong school, um, there's a couple of things I'll have to justify here, but one I'm calling tiao shi, which means breathing methods. There are many, many different types of breathing methods, which we'll discuss as we go on in the presentation. Um, tiao shi is a modern word, but I just use this in order to create a bookmark uh, for what we'll discuss later. Xing qi, or methods of moving qi, which are often also associated with breathing. Uh, dao yin, which means uh, leading and, and stretching, or uh, leading and, and drawing, which is basically um, moving qigong. And cun xiang, or containing the image or visualization. So these are sort of the major genres that are recognized today as being the umbrella categories for Taoist qigong and meditation. Um, however, a lot of the time, the practices have a tendency to bleed into one another. So it's not that there's any uh, very, very pure practice where all of the schools are combined and uh, I'm sorry, where all of the schools are separated completely clearly and um, we can have a, a high, resolu high resolution image of just one of them. Uh, instead, they are subdivided into various different um, combinations and, and we'll get we'll get to that after we talk about sort of what they are uh, in their quote unquote pure forms. So in terms of uh, def defining methods, the first thing I want to look at is breath adjustment methods, so tiao xi. Um, so adjusting the breath it can include multiple different uh, independent methods uh, that have their own unique goals. So the most popular one probably that everybody has heard of is tuna. Tuna means spitting and grasping. So Basically, we draw fresh air in through our noses and we breathe out so-called turbid air from our mouths. Um, this practice is popular both in Taoist texts and in Chinese medicine. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, texts that deal with Tuna methods. Uh, they can be very, very simple and they can be very complex. They can involve some visualization and they don't have to involve visu visualization. It's a pretty big category. Um, the next one is fu qi, which means eating the breath. So the primary difference between fu qi and uh, tuna, fu qi can also be called shi qi, by the way, uh, eating the breath. So the fundamental difference between that and tuna is that generally fu qi is done by breathing in, holding the breath, collecting saliva, swallowing the saliva, and then taking a second breath from the breath hold, so that the breath, uh, so that the saliva is drawn with the breath down to the stomach via the esophagus. And then after that, the breath is released slowly from the mouth. And so um, the most popular document which talks about Fu Qi methods um, is the Yang Xing Yan Ming Lu, or the um, collection of nurturing nature and extending life by Tao Hongjing. Um, and he goes into Fu Qi in a lot of depth, but basically it's used as a way to uh, quite literally eat the qi that we develop by breathing in, developing qi-infused saliva on the breath hold, and then further drawing the breath and the saliva in together as we gulp the saliva down to the stomach and, and bring one more breath there. So that's kind of the idea of fu qi. The next one is bi qi. Bi qi means holding the breath, so this could of course be done in uh, combination with fu qi, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. The idea is that the qi is breathed in, held in the lower dantian, and then um, f usually for a count, uh, what a lot of the old texts say is that you should count using your heartbeats. So they say a heart count of 100 or a heart count of 150. And some of the old documents claim that when you get good at it, you can go up to a thousand. But the idea here is that people, when they were first developing the idea of the lower dantian, they didn't have uh, the same approach that we have now, which is to engender sort of softness and general focus and these kind of things. 
but instead they were working on really getting a lot of breath into the lower dantian so that the qi would naturally attract there. The hypothesis of practice is that the qi is attracted to the breath. And so when we breathe in and we hold the breath in the lower dantian, then more qi will go there and more blood will go there. And then we'll be able to uh, have the qi go to that space and it will be able to move in the body. That's the, that's the basic concept of bi qi. Uh, and then the last one in the breathing that we'll talk about today is tai shi, embryonic breathing, which is actually the high-level variation of any of those practices. So um, in ancient times, in uh, Taoist schools such as that one coming from Tao Hongjing, um, Sun Sun Miao's school, uh, and, and lots and lots of other ones, the idea was that uh, after you get very good at these breathing practices, eventually the lower abdomen relaxes. And once it relaxes, the breath can be placed in the lower ab uh, abdomen without using the nose or mouth to breathe. And so uh, the feeling is that the breath expands and relaxes inside of the lower abdomen, but you don't feel the breath coming and going through your nose and mouth. So this was called embryonic breathing because the idea was that um, it should create qi in the lower abdomen that does the breathing for you, and so that qi is associated with the spiritual embryo, which was, I believe, first discussed in the, the Yellow Cork classic um, by Wei Hua Tun. So after Wei wrote the Yellow Cork classic, many people tried to develop practices which would uh, help to develop these ideas that she'd established about the lower dantian, including developing this, um, spirit, this sort of energetic fetus, so to speak. And so the idea of tai chi or embryonic breathing is that that's sort of the, the developmental stage of that practice. In ancient Taoism, this was considered to be the highest level of practice. Um, but then over time, uh, as the genre changed, then also the comprehension of levels changed as well. So um, then we can move on to some modern methods of breathing. These are not specifically Taoists. These are more Chinese medicine or just standard qigong. But it's important to understand these things so that we can uh, have a clearer picture of the overall genre. The first one is shun hu shi, or smooth breathing. It should say shun shi hu shi, uh, smooth, smooth method breathing or smooth posture breathing. Um, this method is uh, approximately the same one as we would use in Nadan practice or in various forms of Buddhist meditation to calm the mind. When the breath comes into the body, the lower abdomen uh, expands, and when the breath leaves the body, the lower abdomen relaxes. Uh, the next one is nishi, or reverse breathing. And so this one is imported from the martial arts, actually. And it's the reason why I created this modern category to, to discuss breathing methods. So um, there's been a very strong uh, push to associate reverse breathing with internal alchemy. And one of the major reasons for that is because the martial arts became popular um, in Western countries before internal alchemy did. Uh, and so a lot of our ideas about developing qi are imported from the martial arts, especially Tai Chi Chuan, Ba Gua Zhang, and, and Xing Yi Chuan. And so um, people have uh, built in this assumption that because in the martial arts we use reverse breathing in order to get the uh, abdomen to be stable and to get the back to stand up straight, then this must automatically equate to uh, being part of meditation practice. And in fact, um, it's also the case that modern Qigong, uh, especially Chinese medicine Qigong, has uh, wholeheartedly imported many ideas from, from Wushu, from Chinese martial arts. And one of them is uh, using reverse breathing as a method to stimulate the Du Meridian, so the meridian running the length of the spine to the head. Um, and so from the internal alchemy perspective, uh, or even from the medieval Qigong perspective, reverse breathing is virtually never used. Uh, actually, it's not even mentioned uh, until modern times. And the only Taoist text that I've seen that mentions it is the um, Yin Shizhi Jing Zuo Lun. Um, so Yin Shizhi discusses uh, quiet sitting by Jiang Wei Qiao, and that's a very very modern text, which is also uh, which is also syncretic in nature. So I thought it might be useful to mention that, but from the martial arts context or from the modern Qigong context, when you do reverse breathing, on the in-breath you withdraw the abdomen, you slightly pull up the perineum uh, and the anus, and then on the out-breath you relax them. Um, 
Now, there is, if you're really, really well read about Nadan, you might say to me, well, but Robert, there's this whole four-part technique in uh, in the Wulio school and in texts like Xingming Guajer, where they talk about the, the raising of the anus and uh, the sucking in of the breath and, and these things. And so this is one of the places where modern academics have misinterpreted certain ideas um, related to, to earlier Taoist methods through the lens of martial arts. Um, actually, when people talk about these things like the anus pulling up, um, which is associated with a broader set of phenomenon in meditation called Wulong Pengsheng, or the five um, the five dragons push up the sage, uh, these things are all spontaneous actions that happen when you meditate by focusing in the lower abdomen for long enough. And so eventually what will happen is the um, when the yang qi becomes sufficient in the lower abdomen, um, it spontaneously moves up the back and it causes the genitals to contract and the anus to pull up. Usually this only happens once in your entire meditation lifetime. Uh, it's a, just a very particular moment uh, in meditation, and it's not something that you should carry around with you as a, as a post-heaven practice. So again, that's why it's very, very important to talk about modern uh, methods when we look at ancient methods, because uh, often they're directly in conflict with each other. So moving along to the next category, is Xing Qi. I've given it its own category, but Xing Qi is actually an expansion of um, different breathing practices. And in particular, Xing Qi is an expansion of Fu Qi, or swallowing the, swallowing the breath. Um, basically, this is how people got Qi to move in their meridians before they had Nadan. And so the approach to practicing Xing Qi is that you breathe in and you hold the breath um, usually for a count of 100 heartbeats or uh, 150 heartbeats, depending on how much you can do. Uh, honestly, I have a really hard time getting to 100 heartbeats personally. Um, but then you hold the breath uh, for this certain period of time, and it naturally sinks down to the lower dantian. So uh, Tao Hongjing, he talks about the method being uh, you kneel on the ground. Actually, the kneeling is the same posture that um, Japanese people use when they're sitting in formal sitting. Um, if you've ever done karate or one of those arts, it's called seiza. Um, so you kneel on the ground and you massage the body. And then after you massage your body, then you do 10 breath holds. So you eat the breath 10 times. So that's maybe a count of 100 for each time. And then after doing that, the qi goes to the dantian and then it will move in the body. So again, uh, it becomes strong enough to move up the body and it may move according to the the do meridian or it may move up the central channel there's a lot of different ways that it can move but then the idea is that once you can get the chi to move in the body then if there's a part of your body which needs healing then you focus on that part of the body so uh tao hong jing said um wherever you feel bad then you just focus there if you have a if you have pain in your head then you put your attention on your head and you move the the chi there if you have your pain in your feet, then you put your attention on the feet and you move the qi there. So that's the basic idea of xing qi. Now, this practice is a really interesting and cool practice, and it's a it's one fascinating way to get qi to move in your body. Um, but these breath holding practices do have uh, some dangers associated with them. So they're not as safe as dao yin, and they're not as safe as nadan. So they can have very high rewards in terms of uh, opening up your your physical body and opening your energy body. But at the same time, they do have some drawbacks. And uh, in the small Taoist canon, uh, there's actually an entry which says uh, one of the byproducts of breath holding may be that you have red colored urine. So, and then it says, but but that's just a sign that it's working. So I would advise you to be really cautious if you practice these types of breathing techniques from the, from the old Taoist schools, um, because nobody needs uh, internal damage. Um, having said that, the best advice I've ever seen about them is that you should maintain emptiness and openness when you practice and not let the breath become overly stuck in one place. So you don't need to overly inflate one individual place like the bladder or the upper abdomen. Um, these type of practices need, uh, they need a teacher to be able to understand them well because um, if you try to reproduce them by yourself and you make mistakes, it could end up with negative results. And so this is one of the reasons why people began to move toward a different way of practicing. Um, now, Daoyin, uh, it's its own thing. So in modern 
times we think of Daoyin as moving Qigong, right? Donggong is basically Daoyin. Um, but ancient Daoyin and modern Daoyin are incredibly different. So modern Daoyin that you see in popular Qigong systems like, um, let's say, Daiyan Qigong or Zhenang Qigong or Hunyuan Qigong, uh, tends to be done in a standing posture, and the standing posture tends to be Wu Ji Bu, uh, the, the non polarity posture from Taiji. Um, so they take a martial arts posture and then they do their Qigong uh, holding that posture. But in medieval times, Dao Yin was typically done well seated. And so um, practices like the Ba Duan Jin, right, the eight silk brocades, were originally done as a seated exercise. And incidentally, um, there's not just eight silk brocades, there's like 24 of them, uh, with some systems having 8, some systems having 16, and some systems having even more. So often these practices were done sitting, or they might be done standing, but they'd be done holding specific posture for, postures. So as an example, the five animal frolics, um, the Wu Qin Shi, or I've called it the five animal performances, um, those practices in modern times are done starting from a Wushu posture, but in ancient times when people like Tao Hong Jing taught them, uh, he didn't tell you to do them in a set, he just explains each of them. And so, as an example, um, the the tiger is done while squatting, and then, you know, you turn your, you turn your eyes and your body to look up behind you uh, while you're in a squatting position, and it stretches out the back. That's just, just one example from Tao Hong Jing's writings. And so, uh, the idea of Dao Yin in old times uh, is totally different from the idea of moving Qigong today, because moving Qigong these days has been so heavily influenced by Taiji Chuan, especially. Uh, and that just happens to be uh, associated with the case that uh, during the 1950s, when Qigong began to take off in China, there was an advisory board set up by the CCP that specifically looked at how to develop Qigong in the best way. And so um, what happened was various different figures uh, like Chen Ying Ning, uh, who was a, a Taoist practitioner, um, as well as the, the creator of uh, um, Neyang Gong, uh, his name escapes me for the moment, but he was the one of the first really big Qigong masters, and a bunch of other people, a bunch of Taiji masters, were brought together to uh, basically develop uh, rudimentary principles for modern Qigong based on the myriad of old practices that were already around. And so as a result of that, what we see in, in modern Qigong practices, especially post-1980s, um, is uh, a real diversity of ideas, a diversity of practices, but also a, a general implementation of, of basic wushu principles into the Qigong practices. So um, to give you an idea, I'll show you some images of what some old school Daoyin uh, practices looked like. So here's a couple. So uh, you might recognize the top one, grasping the core or uh, wogu, from what Ian taught at the start of the seminar we put our hands in loose fists, right? And then put them at our sides. And in the Dao De Jing, um, Lao Tzu says, a baby uh, is weak, but it can grasp its fist and nobody can open it, right? So its fist is, it grasps very firmly. And so this is where this idea comes from. Uh, most of the Taoist Qigong practices have some sort of root in either the Dao De Jing or Zhuang Tzu. Uh, those are really the main core texts that influence um, these energetic practices. And so uh, that would be considered Dao Yin. Uh, the next one you see, uh, beating the heavenly drum. Uh, this one is done by putting your hands behind your head, cupping your ears closed, and then tapping on the back of your head with your forefingers at the feng chi acupoint. So that would also be considered as Dao Yin. Um, it's meant to open up the uh, back of the head, improve hearing, improve vision, and open up the spine. Um, that might be done in other combination with other, other practices like clicking the teeth and then swallowing the saliva and carrying it down to the down to the abdomen, for instance. So these are things which would be considered as uh, classic Daoyin that you don't see as much in modern Qigong. Um, another one here pushing up the sky. So you see this one in, uh, in the eight silk brocades, of course, but uh, typically they're doing it standing and not sitting. And so you can see that there's a big difference between uh, the way that people were doing things in, in olden times and uh, in, for, in a more modern context. But one of the things that is really interesting to note is that um, 
people in China are becoming more and more interested in researching these practices, and so they're starting to recreate the old practices. And that's also true in Japan. Um, one of the better presentations of the Baduanjin that I've seen from the seated perspective was actually in a video that was uh, put out by a, a Japanese researcher. Um, and so people are going into the, the old texts and starting to reverse engineer the old practices out of them, which I think is uh, very useful. Although I, I personally uh, believe that modern Qigong actually has some advantages over traditional Taoist Qigong, um, I think it's important to go back and, and uh, understand the practices on their own terms and then you know maybe do the re-engineering of them again uh, with with the benefits of those practices in mind, because I think the 1980s Qigong fever period was a little bit on the wild side, so maybe we need to weed the garden a little bit. So the next category is Cunxiang, or visualization. Um, it originated sometime before the first century, uh, and there were a number of visualization practices um, in, in ancient times, uh, but the person who really guided them toward becoming phenomenally important in Taoist practice was uh, Wei Hua Cun, uh, the founder of the Shangqing school of, of uh, Taoism. And so visualization uh, can be done in a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of the time in ancient, ancient times, they were visual, visualizing deities, either inside of the body or outside of the body, um, visualizing different cosmic bodies, stars, uh, the sun, the moon, constellations, Visualizing different colors, um, visualizing the organs of the body, right, which uh, we did earlier with, with Ian during the, the 13 um, nurturing health methods. Visualizing chi in the body, visualizing a talisman, uh, visualizing mythological animals. There's lots of different types of visualization that can happen. Um, but generally speaking, uh, the most popular types within Taoism are the Shangqing approach and the Lingdao approach. So the Shangqing approach is largely dependent on visualizing deities actually inside of the organs of the body. Um, the Yellow Court Classic by Wei Hua Cun um, mostly focuses on organs that surround the lower Dantian, but there were a lot of other methods as well where people would start above the head and build all the way down to the bottom of the feet and practice something called Shou Yi, or protecting the one. Um, in that practice, people would Imagine each of the individual body deities in their proper place and then hold them all together uh, in order to enter into a state of spiritual unity. And in a roundabout way, this is kind of also a forerunner to Nadan. Although Nadan is very different, it doesn't use visualization to the same extent. It's a um, the idea of putting things together and then protecting oneness is sort of like a, a preamble to what would ultimately become internal alchemy. Um, now, on the other hand, the Lingbao approach to things is to imagine a cosmic body coming into the human body in some way. And so, as an example, uh, you could imagine the um, small, the little dipper coming in through the top of the head, through the baihui, and then going down to the dantian and holding it in the dantian. That's one popular meditation. Another one that I like is... Uh, standing in front of the sun in the early morning and uh, seeing the sunshine come through the eyes with eyes either mostly closed or completely closed and then imagining it uh, shining down to the bottom of the feet or doing the same thing with the moon during a full moon at night. Um, so these are all things which are either part of Lingbao or were uh, influenced by Lingbao. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of different visualization documents in the Taoist canon. Uh, the small Taoist canon also has a very big collection of them. Um, visualization, again, it has its benefits and it has its um, detracting points. One of the major benefits of visualization is that it can allow people to um, develop sensations of qi very quickly, and so it's useful in that way. Uh, one of the negatives about visualization is that it can make people feel tired, um, and if you use too much power or too much strength when you do it, um, it can be really, really exhausting and, and be bad for your chi, actually. And so uh, later generations, such as the Nadan school, often criticized visualization, but at the same time, uh, 
if it's done as part of a, a healthy regimen of practices and it's done in the right way, there's really nothing wrong with it. Um, this is just my attempt to be artistic, so never mind that. So now we can get into the schools of Taoist meditation. Um, I am looking at meditation here through the perspective of something that can lead to apophysis and lead to realization of innate nature. So one of the major differences between Qigong techniques and meditation techniques is that uh, Qigong techniques can help us build up our sense of energy, they can help us repair our bodies, and they can help us focus our minds. But uh, because they emphasize the use of the mind without entering into a pure meditative state or a pure apophatic self-negating state, um, it's not possible to go beyond the boundaries of the mind. And so uh, meditation is something which is designed in order to allow us to do that, while perhaps having other features as well. So when we look at the various types of uh, Taoist meditation practices that have been the most popular, because there's quite a lot of them, so we can't talk about every single one, um, we're looking at Zuo Wang, so sitting and forgetting. Uh, sitting and forgetting was pioneered by Sima Qiong, uh, Sima uh, Qian Zheng, I think his name was, or Cheng Zhen. Um, anyway, he was a he was the sixth patriarch of the Shangqing school of Taoism, and uh, he designed a meditation system that was based on entering into uh, a state of self forgetting, self negation, um, in order to allow his qi or the qi of the practitioner to blend with the qi in the environment. So the idea is that uh, one of the high-level practices in Taoist meditation is that the qi of the human body blends with what's called tai ho yuan qi, or the great original, the the qi of the great original um, harmony. And so this is the qi outside of the body. And when the inner qi can mix with the qi of the environment, then it's possible to come into harmony with the environment. Right? That's approximately the idea um, of this type of meditation practice. So. Um, Sima Cheng Zhen, he pioneered that practice, and he wrote a couple of different texts. One of the texts was called Jing Zuo Lun, or a discussion of uh, sitting and forgetting, and the other one um, was called, uh, um, let me just think about that. Uh, I can't remember exactly, sorry about that, but it was he basically used his Taoist name, which was uh, something like the uh, the wonderful hermit. Uh, anyway, so um, memory problems aside, basically uh, his idea in the second text that I mentioned was that um, you should do visualization and then you should do sitting and forgetting. And so he'd created a multi-step process by which you could go into meditation, which starts with um, staying in a clean place, doing self-massage, and then um, focusing on the entire body, which he calls tun xiang, um, or visualization. So you visualize the entire body as one piece, and then once you can feel the entire body, allowing yourself to sit and forgetting. And so when you sit and forget, then you're able to break desire, and you're able to have your spirit mix with the environment around you. This is the, the basic premise of, of that aspect of, of sitting and forgetting um, associated with Ma Cheng Zhen's work. Uh, another one is Ding Guan. So Ding Guan um, it is the Taoist answer to the Tiantai Buddhist school Zhiguan technique. So Zhiguan means stopping and observing. Um, Ding Guan means making the observation stable or focusing the ob observation. And uh, that method of practice is uh, not very, very well elaborated on in the literature. Um, the most popular text is Ding Guan Jing, or the, the classic of stabilizing concentration. Um, and uh, basically, it's more concerned with stabilizing the, the spirit or, you know, revealing the innate nature of, of consciousness. Um, now, it's been played with by various different people, and there's different answers about it, but what it tries to do approximately is to copy the uh, Buddhist technique of Zhiguan, where you use um, focus to establish uh, mental concentration, and then you use uh, observation and stillness to release the tension of focus. So anybody who's ever practiced 
Vadriana uh, will have been exposed to that, where they do this um, stable gazing exercise where they'll set up an object outside of them and then observe the object. And, you know, when their mind starts to wander, they tighten up their observation a bit. And when their attention becomes too tight, they release it a little bit, right? This is the same same basic principle as, as Jirguan and as Dingguan, even though they're maybe practiced in different ways. But I don't want to go into Jirguan theory too much today because it would be... Uh, it would take a while. And so then the next one is uh, Tai Shi. So again, Tai, whoa, this one, you know, Tai Shi is awesome. It um, it has both meditation and Qigong connotations. And the reason for that is because Tai Shi has two different applications. So the first application of Tai Shi is um, once you master these breathing techniques, then the breathing eventually becomes still and uh, doesn't come through the nose or go through the mouth. And it just stays resting in the lower dantian in stillness. So that's the qigong equivalent of, of embryonic breathing. But there's also another version um, which is used in the nadan school, which is the basic breathing of nadan, where the breath is very soft and very gentle and very shallow, um, but it enters into the body quite deeply. As Ian mentioned uh, during his class, the breathing he was teaching you was nadan breathing applied within uh, traditional um, daoyin technique. So that breathing is also used in Nadan practice, and when it goes to the lower Dantian, it's called Tai Shi, or embryonic breathing. There's different levels of Tai Shi, and different texts view it differently, so some people might say, um, I'm wrong about this because uh, Tai Shi means when the breath seems to stop completely, and it can't be perceived as coming through the nose. Um, that's also correct. Uh, it depends what documents you're looking at. So Xingming Guizhi, for instance, uses Tai Chi as the first technique that they practice of breathing, where you just get the breath to rest in the lower Dantian under the umbilicus, whereas um, some other texts that came along later, like uh, um, Xingming Fajui by, by Zhao Bichen uh, from the Qianfeng lineage, they talk about Tai Chi as being when the breath absolutely stops. So they use the older Qigong uh, version of Tai Chi to explain the technique. Um, there's a lot of different variation in, in meditation schools, and... Uh, Sometimes people use the same terms in different ways, as, as uh, Wes mentioned also in his lecture. Um, and so then the next one after that is Nadan. So Nadan uh, Internal Alchemy, which is, of course, the uh, house favorite here at, at the Penglai Fellowship, um, is a method of meditation which is designed in order to stimulate the chi of the body and also to allow for spiritual realization. And so, whereas a lot of Qigong techniques only work with Jing and Qi, and a lot of meditation techniques only work with the spirit, Nadan sort of seeks to work with all three different parts of the three treasures. And so, the Nadan technique basically involves establishing concentration, typically in the lower abdomen, and then, once the concentration is stable, releasing the concentration, entering into a state of apophysis, in which a number of natural physiological activities take place, which cause qi to move in the body, and then using the qi that moves in the body to um, repair different parts of the body, like the spine and the brain, and then bringing it back to the, the lower dantian for storage. Over enough time, all of the energy uh, vessels of the body open, and then eventually from there, um, that energetic opening provides a basis for the realization of... of um, stillness and clarity, which is the, the work of realizing our, our original nature. So that's kind of the context of uh, what Nadan is in, in a nutshell. Um, and so it relies a lot on establishing concentration and then letting go of concentration. And then at a high level, um, it's more letting go and less establishing. So then, of course, there are also many combined styles. Um, there are styles which merge different Qigong techniques, there's styles that merge meditation and qigong together. There's styles that merge different types of meditation. And they're not all necessarily actively named. Um, they tend to usually be methods that people leave behind. So as an example, um, the 13 rules of nurturing life that uh, Ian taught some of, to, some of it to us at the start of the seminar is a com uh, combined technique where... Um, Dao Yin is used, visualization is used, and at certain points in the technique, certain elements of Nadan are used as well. Uh, and they're all sort of woven together in a, in a cohesive whole, 
in order to provide uh, a better overall energetic experience, uh, especially for people who are new to the genre. So these kind of techniques are, are very common and they exist in a lot of different formats. Um, a very popular early text that discussed these type of things was Yang Xing Yan Minglu. So Tao Hongjing uh, wrote this, doc, um, this document, which is mostly breathing and Tao Yin exercises. So it's largely really focused on um, maintaining health and, and generating healthy qi and these kind of things. You can think of it as sort of like a, a medieval version of what would later become modern qigong. Uh, another one that's great is the Thousand Gold Pieces Prescriptions by Sun Sun Yao. Um, that text uh, combines a lot of different um, visualization and meditation practices, a little bit of self-massage, a little bit of Tao Yin. Um, and ultimately ends in what Sun Sun Miao calls um, Ding Guan Tai Shi, so stable focus embryonic breathing, which is his version of embryonic breathing. And the reason why he uses the term stable focus in front of embryonic breathing is because his idea is that the mind is in a focused state of meditation during the embryonic breathing, rather than having the mind wander away to, to other affairs or going into complete darkness and becoming dissipated. So you can see these, these methods get combined together quite a lot. Um, nobody ever bothered to standardize them in ancient times. And so in modern times, the modern Qigong schools have standardized them to a certain extent. Um, Nadan was very well standardized after Chen Yingning um, researched the entire genre. Um, but a lot of the old Qigong methods uh, are you know, they can be mixed and matched in a lot of different ways. Um, I've made an image here for embryonic breathing, but actually this was just the one picture I could find where a person has uh, the embryo in their dantian. This is actually a uh, Nadan picture from the text Xingming Guajir, um, which is, is about the development of the spiritual embryo. So it's act after the embryonic breathing stage. Um, another important combination text is Lingbao Bifa. So Lingbao Bifa was written by uh, um, Shi uh, Jianwu, and uh, he was one of the major figures in the late Tang Dynasty um, movement associated with uh, Lu Dongbin's method of internal elixir practice. Um, basically, uh, Lu Dongbin left behind a whole bunch of terse poetry that describes the process of de developing the internal elixir. Um, and then people tried to figure out what he was saying. So Shi Jianwu uh, and other people like Chen Pu um, were in an intermediary stage between Taoist Qigong practices and Nadan, where they were trying to figure out what Lu Dongbin was talking about. And so each of them came up with their own method. And that method is broadly talked about as um, Zhonglu Jindan Pai, so the Han Zhongli and Lu Dongbin's uh, golden elixir school. So it's not Nadan. Nadan came in the next generation after that. That was created by Zhang Boduan. But uh, this school of thought basically uses Lu Dongbin's principles of stillness and internal quiet and uh, protecting uh, Wu Wei and these different kinds of things, and then applies them to medieval Taoist Qigong practices. And so um, the Lingbao Bifa is a good example of that. It starts out with things like holding the breath and doing various types of Daoyin and visualization to move the qi. And then toward the end of the book, it starts to empty it out and talk about realization of, of non-polarity and things like that. Um, and uh, also the next one below that, uh, the um, Qian Xian, uh, Qian Xian Zheng Nei Dan Jui, uh, Mr. Chen's Internal Alchemy Poem, is another uh, Zhonglu Jindan school uh, text that was written by Chen Pu. Um, again, similar idea. His version of Na or his version of golden elixir practice is that you um, close the mouth and put the tongue to the roof of the mouth, and then the qi goes up from the upper gums to the top of the head, enters into the baihui, and then goes directly down to the heart, where it transitions to the gallbladder, and then from the gallbladder it gets expressed around the meridians. So at that time in history, during the end of the Tang Dynasty, there was a really uh, diverse understanding of how to practice the golden elixir and uh it was uh there were tons of documents at that, at that time 
uh, Wes actually quoted one of them, which is the Ruyao Jing, uh, entering the medicine mirror, where he said the pre-heaven uh, qi and the post-heaven breath, when they're combined together, it will seem as though you're drunk. Um, this actually is one of the better documents. Uh, it's, it's much closer to Nadan, and it's sort of a transitional document between that period and the Nadan period. There's a couple of other ones too, like Eryong Jing, um, the daily use classic. Um, I think Wes is, is working on uh, translating them, and so uh, hopefully someday, not too long from now, uh, you'll have a chance to get your hands on them. Um, we've we've identified a bunch of late Tang period uh, documents that really sum up the evolution from Taoist Qigong, going beyond Taoist Qigong into into Nadan practice. And uh, we're planning to uh, part of part of our work at the Peng Lai Fellowship is to um, put out comprehensive uh, textual research to to show uh, our understanding of how the Nadan genre came into being. So you can look forward to that sometime probably next year. Uh, another great text for combining various Taoist Qigong techniques is the Dao Shu or the Pivot of the Dao. It's a Taoist Qigong textbook which lists many different methods as a sort of catalog of practices. It also has an important history section, which uh, I think erroneously explains some of the history, but it's still worth a look. Um, another one is Yunji Qiqian, or the um, the basket of, uh, of, of scrolls. Um, this is a small version of the Taoist canon, which was put together uh, during the late Song dynasty, and it is talking mainly about things like visualization, breath work, um, making the external elixir, uh, which none of you should try to do, by the way, um, and then lots of different other miscellaneous practices. Uh, so all of these different texts, they have different um, sort of telos to them. Um, their, their understanding of how you get to the Tao is different, and uh, maybe even their understanding of the Tao could be subtly different as well relative to their realization. So what you see a lot of the time in the old documents is that there is uh, originally some documents which simply provide individual methods. They're usually quite short. And then people start to put them together in different ways to try to figure out how you could use them to actually get to the Tao. Um, one of the, there's also a bunch of more modern ones. Um, the Ludi Xianjing, or the um, Immortals Walking on Earth classic, uh, is one from the 19th century that puts together uh, a lot of different nurturing health exercises um, into, into a sort of comprehensive bundle. Again, it's um, I think its practices are more acceptable to modern people than, than the older practices, um, and they're a little bit closer to modern Qigong. So throughout the, the history and the development of these ideas, What's happened is that there's been a syncretism where different things get put together in different ways, and eventually it developed it up into the sort of modern period where um, the real difference between practices now is between Qigong as a, as a practice and meditation as a standalone practice. Um, some schools also combine Qigong and meditation. Um, there's plenty of schools that are sort of like a buffet model as well. Um, but one of the things I'm really interested in showing is that there's not a comprehensive point at which Qigong broke away from traditional practices, but instead there's been a gradual syncretism over time that's caused traditional practices to, to merge together and to develop, develop into sort of a concrete whole uh, that today is represented by modern Qigong. Um, and so when you, uh, when you practice, it's not that you have to find the most authentic, most original thing. Um, if you tried to practice those old documents from the Warring States period, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to figure out how to do it properly. Many of the cultural assumptions we have today are very different from ancient cultural assumptions. Um, and so what's probably a better way to do things if you want to really have a comprehensive practice is to research old documents, try to understand them um, in a, as, as a genre, uh, and then go through each of the ones that you work with uh, try to extract as much information as possible, and then apply it from within the framework of a modern practice, so a modern meditation practice or a modern Qigong practice. And then that way, it's possible to take the, the really deep benefit from old documents and old ideas while simultaneously integrating them into uh, 
a type of practice that's manageable for you today rather than uh you know having to do what Tao Hong Jing says which is hold your breath and swallow your saliva a thousand times a day um this is uh I, I can't get past 10. So um, I, I think that it's really important to uh, try to understand clearly what these things are about and then um, figure out how to get the benefit from them on your own terms. So let me just see if there's anything else here. So some closing thoughts. Um, so modern scholars like Hu Fu Chen, who I, I draw on a lot, he's one of the better ones, um, it's not that there's not other scholars, there's tons of people out there. It's just that um, there's a lot of books that get published which are about important subjects, but the authors have, um, have a bias. So I'll give you an example. I have a book that's lying around my house which is about the Zhonglu Jindan School. And it's, it's, it's a university published book, it's by respectable researchers, but the author... Um, is very very dedicated to that worldview and so um you know he spends a chapter going on about how it's uh predicted that many of these ancient people who practiced in certain ways could live for eight or nine hundred years and all of these kind of things which are just uh are just rubbish as far as i can tell so um i like to stick to people who are who are very no nonsense hu fu chen is uh is one of the modern ones who's good chen ying ning of course is uh is wonderful um and there are various other figures too. But anyway, uh, what many of the modern people are trying to point out is that there's, and I would be remiss to, not to say that the Chinese medicine research about Qigong is much, much better than the Taoist research about Qigong. Um, but anyway, they're pointing out that a lot of these practices, they are different ways of building a trajectory from a beginner stage to whatever that school views as being the final stage of practice. And uh, typically what happens is that individual techniques will be developed, they'll be codified into documents, and then people draw them into broader techniques over time by annotating them into their own texts. Um, so then a lot of the time the Qigong methods are typically about developing the body, whereas meditation methods are either typically about developing yourself spiritually or physically and spiritually at the same time, as is the case with internal alchemy. Um, the, system, the systematization of these practices into something that everybody can agree on is a 20th century thing. Uh, before that, you see a lot of method texts, but nobody completely agrees on the whole genre. Uh, it was only after the 1950s that they started to get committees together to actually uh, attempt to really uh, define and refine the genres into something that everybody could understand clearly. And so... It's important also to recognize uh, the possible limitations of that. Um, anyway, I am going to... Oh, okay, there's even more. So, sort of as an end thought, uh, because we have the internet and we can get uh, literally thousands of these texts with the click of a button, many of them are translated, many of them are not, um, then it makes it possible to speed up the process of research. It makes it possible to research as a team, uh, not just a team, but as a web of people. And it makes it possible to have a very lively conversation. One of the things that we have to make sure we do when we have this conversation is to allow for heterogeneity. Um, it would be a big mistake to uh, factionalize. And so one of the goals that we have at the Peng Lai Fellowship is not just to promote our own people, which if, this is our first seminar, so of course we're doing that, but eventually our goal is to also bring people in from outside um, with views which are heterogeneous to ours um, in order to have a, a real conversation about these things. Um, and then hopefully in the long run that will um, positively affect the level of knowledge and discourse about Qigong and meditation in the, in the broader, let's say, online Taoist community. So uh, on behalf of uh, Ian, Wes, and myself, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I hope that you had a, a good time and that it was informative. Um, here's me plugging some classes that I'm teaching, and uh, I will open it up to uh, questions for anybody who has any.